I'm very, very pleased to welcome the U.S. government delegation uh, that is involved directly with citizen engagement. Uh, we have Mr. Macon Phillips, which I will in a minute tell you about, about a little bit of his biography from the, straight from the White House. He's the White House Senior Director of New Media. We have Kemi Croft in the first row here, who is a senior, uh, he was a new, new media director of the Department of Energy, but in the previously worked with Macon in the White House. And we have Peter Levine here, who is from the, from, he is a new media advisor and chief technology officer of the, of the Secretary of Veteran Affairs. And so this, we have, we are very privileged to have these three leading people who create and use new media to engage people in politics. And now a little bit background of Mr. Macon Phillips. Macon Phillips served as special assistant to the President Obama and Director of Digital Strategy at the White House today. As Director of Digital Strategy at the White House, Mr. Phillips develops and manages uh, the Obama administration online program, including whitehouse.gov. The, the White House new media strategy is very innovative and set the foundations for what we call today digital diplomacy. So we made a great contribution to our academics so we can study what you're doing, and we call it digital diplomacy. Uh, Mr. Phillips ran the new media program for the presidential transition team, change.gov, change and served as a deputy director of Obama campaign new media department. Prior to the campaign, Mr. Phillips led Blue State digital strategy practice working with clients like the Democratic National Committee and Senator Ted Kennedy. He is an American Corps Vista alum. And it's, it's, a, it's a group that deals with uh, fighting poverty in the United States. Uh, he's an uh, Alabama native and a graduate of Duke University. We would like to thank the head of the Digital Diplomacy Department and Foreign Ministry, Mr. Yoram Morad, right here. Uh, thanks to him and to the new media director of the Prime Minister Office, Dr. Eitan el uh, who really uh, gave us the opportunity to host this uh, great team at, at uh, our school today. So we are very thankful to, to you, Yoram, and to you, Eitan, for bringing this uh, team to us here. And uh, so, Mr. Macon Phillips, I know we keep you busy all morning. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to our students. Please, thank you. All right. Thank you, and uh, thanks for such hospitality this morning. Uh, we've been here for two days. I feel like I've been here for a week. We've learned so much and seen so much. Um, uh, thanks to our, our wonderful hosts. Um, it's, a, it's been a really uh, an eye-opening experience um, and kind of a whirlwind. So I'm kind of catching my breath. I've been running around all morning, so I, I apologize for that. Before we jump into my presentation, let me do this quick poll. Um, how many of you have ever been to BarackObama.com? All right. Now keep your hands up. If this, how many of you have been to WhiteHouse.gov? Hey, all right. That's good. All right. So it's, this is a big difference just from the outset before I dive into my presentation that people should understand. Uh, the presidential campaign in 2007, 2008 really put uh, the online program for the president, uh, then candidate Obama, on the map. So people are really familiar with uh, his Twitter account, at Barack Obama, his Facebook page, the Barack Obama profile, BarackObama.com, and so forth. I don't work on that anymore. I work on the official side, whitehouse.gov, the White House Facebook page, the White House Twitter feed. So a lot of the things I'm going to, or all the things I'm going to show you, rather, have to do with the official government side, just as a, as a clarification. Um, I'm also going to, let me see if I can get this thing to work. All right. So I have a, a few slides uh, to go through here, um, and then I have a few videos, one of them which features myself, so I apologize in advance for that. <laughs> um, let's see here. I just scroll with this. All right, so White House Digital Strategy. What, what is White House Digital Strategy? What does that mean? Um, the history of the office is that, can you guys, should I stay on the mic here or can I walk around? Let's see here. Does this work? Does this, hello? Is this, whoa, that's on. All right, so the history of the office didn't exist in the previous administration. There was uh, one guy... Uh, who posted things to the website. Um, and when we came in in 2009, um, we had a blank canvas. 
Um, we were coming off the presidential campaign. We knew there was something to using these new online tools to change the way elections were run, but we were faced with this question of, can we actually use online tools to change the way government runs? And I should say also at the outset, my focus from time to time is pretty broad across the administration, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I think about these three goals in the context of the business of the White House. My colleagues from the Department of Energy, Department of Veteran Affairs, and other colleagues at the State Department, uh, Department of Education, and so forth, spend a lot of their time thinking about the specific areas, specifically around citizen services. How do, we, how do we use the internet to give better outcomes to veterans getting health care? How do we promote energy efficiency through the Department of Energy using mobile apps? How do we change the way foreign diplomacy is done using the internet? These are huge questions. They aren't questions I necessarily think about every day. So a lot of credit goes to them for really pushing the envelope on that. What I can talk about is President Obama and the business of the White House and what we're focused on. And over the last three years, the majority of our focus has been domestic. We've been really focused on the economy. We came into office with some huge challenges on the economic front. So a lot of my examples have to do with that. But our three goals. First off, how do we amplify the president's message as technology changes how and where people get information? My guess is this is going to be a lot more obvious to you guys than most of the groups I talk to. But people aren't getting their news from TV and newspapers. Uh, well, rather, many people are, but an increasing number of people are getting it from other sources. And we want to make sure that we have a voice there. We want to make sure that as people are learning about issues on social media or an email or what have you, that we have a presence there. The second is how do we open up the, uh, the White House? How do we use the online program to open up the White House, not just living up to the president's commitment to an open and transparent government, but living up to the responsibility that institutions have to be a primary source of content for regular people. You know, and I'll have some examples about that too. Then the third is the most exciting. How do we use the online program to create meaningful opportunities for people to be able to participate in their government? This sort of gets back to how we change the way campaigns are run. Can we actually have an impact on how government works? So to achieve these goals, we organize the teams this is sort of a, this is a good example of, of the evolution of our team. We have four competencies, and really we should probably have three at this point. Um, the first has to do with content. So copywriting. You guys know this as, as well as anyone. It's really hard to write good copy for the web. It's really hard to take complex issues and write them into plain English, or I guess plain Hebrew. Um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to take that and make it something that people who haven't studied an issue can immediately get. It's hard to write scripts. You know? So we have folks who sit, sit down and think about that on a daily basis. They curate the blog. They, they try to find interesting stories from around the government and, and, and really invite people to publish on the White House site and otherwise. Uh, we have our video teams there. They're doing a lot of editing and shooting. The second area that we have is our platform. Platform has our creative director. Just a, a secret. It's not so much a secret, but a tip. Beautiful design matters. It really does. Are there any graphic designers in the room? Kind of aspiring ones? The rest of you should become friends with that guy. <laughs> because you can have great copy, you can have awesome technology, but if your user interface, if it isn't something that's beautiful, it's not going to be used as widely. We saw that with Apple products, of course, but beyond that, user interface matters. And not just aesthetics like color choices and color palettes, but intuitiveness in terms of developing new tools. Presentation is really important. So one of the first choices we made was bringing in a professional uh, creative director to oversee our information architecture and our design choices. And he works with a liaison to another department we have that deals with technology. So all the grumpy engineers and those guys, we have a guy that sort of interfaces with them and helps do the project management around developing our tools. The third group is our outreach group. So this is, have any of you ever seen the movie Field of Dreams? All right, all right. So the big expression from that is, um, if you build it, they will come. The guy builds a baseball field in the middle of Iowa, assuming that if he builds a baseball field, he can fill it up with audience, right? We didn't want to build a site and just sort of have great content, but no one using it. The way I sum that up is the only person who has whitehouse.gov as their homepage is my mother. <laughs> right? Everyone else is already going to other places, and we want to make sure, as I said earlier, that we're there and to some extent, driving people back to our site. Um, that also is the area where our social media lives. Um, our developing our Facebook presence, 
our Twitter presence, and so forth. And the final area is uh, engagement. And this gets that third goal I talked about with participation. So we knew early on that there would be, I think, an inherent strength at the White House because of its communications department to push out content. Processing all this feedback that came in was going to take new muscles. Uh, and I'll talk about a project at the end of this that, that really is taking new muscles. But th this is a group that really thinks about engagement in terms of public participation and making sure that it's meaningful. And to be honest, those last two groups, they could probably be one group at this point, given how much success we've, we've, we've seen using our social media program. Those two work very closely together. All right, back to our goals. And I apologize, there's some folks that have been going around with me the last two days. They, this is the eighth time they've heard me go over our three goals. With the rest of you, stay interested. All right, amplify. So what does that mean? Get anywhere but our White House website. As I said earlier, we want to go where people are. So what does that mean? Some of these examples may not make sense to you, but I'll sort of explain it. The top is uh, this woman named uh, Heather Armstrong. She goes by Deuce. She is an incredibly popular blogger among moms. Turns out, like, moms like to share tips and probably complain about their kids some, but, like, you know, really sort of have a community that's pretty vibrant. And uh, we have a lot of issues that matters, matter to moms, whether it's healthcare or education or otherwise. We actually reached out to her and did an interview on Twitter where she posed questions and we answered them, but she retweeted the answers to, uh, yeah, I think she has like 200,000 followers. So it was sort of using a traditional media model in a new media way to reach an audience that frankly probably wouldn't have otherwise reached. WebMD. Is, is WebMD known here? Do you guys know WebMD? No, yes, no. All right, so if you have like a rash, you'll go to WebMD to be like, is this like a thing or not? You know, it's like a, it's like a healthcare resource, right? So when we're talking about healthcare, I don't have any, I don't have a rash, just so you know. <laughs> when we're talking about healthcare reform, we can spend all day talking to policy wonks about it, and we do. But in addition to that, we want to talk to regular consumers who are interested in healthcare issues. We want to reach them in a context where they're thinking about healthcare and we can talk to them about larger healthcare policies that might impact them, whether it's free preventative care, whether it's sort of more tools on their insurance system, what have you. And I know healthcare as an issue is a little bit different in every country, but for us, it's a pretty big deal. Epicurious, recipe site. The First Lady has an um, initiative to combat childhood obesity, and she wants to get recipes out there about healthy meals. Epicurious is pushing recipes and it's a huge online community. That's a great opportunity for us to work together to make sure that we're helping get that information out. Good, do you guys know good? All right, if you're interested in graphic design, communication, and just new ways of, of communicating, this is a great site. Great, smart people there. Not the biggest site in the world, but it reaches a very select group of people that are interested in infographics. They're interested in new types of online engagement. It's called good.is, good is. Check it out. For us, it was a great way to reach a small group of influential experts uh, around an issue, which sort of goes to one of the lessons. You know, online reach isn't always about aggregate numbers. It's not about whose audience is bigger than whose. It's also about who that audience is. You can actually have more meaningful interactions with 2,000, 3,000 people, 200, 300, rather than 300,000 or 3 million. It just depends on what your goal is. Uh, Hispanic Roundtable. This is a good example of, of how we actually had a summit at the White House where we, we went on Quantcast. So there's a lot of these tools out there that will help you understand what the most popular websites are in a certain topic. And we just invited the people that had the most popular websites with a Latino audience to the White House. And these weren't just you know, political sites. These were Yahoo, uh, MSN, um, all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of communities, uh, and asked them to interview the president. And they sat down and they did. And that was an incredible way for us to reach people that we might not otherwise have reached. And then finally, American Express is sort of an interesting one that we did. When we had some information we wanted to talk about in terms of small business, uh, American Express actually has a whole website for its small business customers. And I don't know, again, if it's that popular here, but the small business credit card with American Express is a, is a hugely popular thing. 
Uh, and we actually provided content for their website so that small business owners like this woman in the kiosk could actually interact directly with the Small Business Administration in the White House. Now, look, I, I know some of you probably came in here thinking you're going to learn, like, the secrets of tweeting effectively or, like, how to Facebook really well or what have you. I kind of put this slide at the beginning to point out that a lot of the interesting work being done is at the sort of macro level, right? It's at the, it's at the big piece level. It's realizing that just because you have a website doesn't mean that all your business needs to take, be, take place on your website. The Internet is an incredibly exciting place, particularly sometimes when you can find these cool opportunities where you don't need to do a lot of work. They're just interested in talking to you. But, of course, we're on social media. And, you know, we're, we're on a bunch of different services. I can talk about each one specifically. I'll bring a few up in the context of specific examples. But I'm going to try to save some uh, room at the end for questions, so we'll, we'll come back to this. One of the cool things that we've started doing, um, I just wanted to point out, is uh, tweet ups. And um, so with tweet ups, we have, I think, over 2 million people that follow us on Twitter. And when we have cool events at the White House, we'll actually post to Twitter, who wants to come? And people are like, what? <laughs> you know? And we get thousands of responses from people that say, I want to come be a part of that. And they fly in from around the country to events like this. And I don't know if you guys can read this, but it says, stood in the rain three hours here at the South Lawn of the White House, soaked to the skin, totally worth it. This is the guy taking a picture of this phone of meeting the president. You know, for us, that's important because it's connecting our online program with an offline reality. Now, when these folks come, many times they also get policy briefings, which is interesting because we're able to explain our policy to them. That's like one value, right? Our policymakers are actually able to hear reactions they might not otherwise hear from people like regular people asking regular questions, which is a second, second value. The third for our content team is sort of derivative of that. We get to listen to how regular people approach these issues and develop content moving forward based on that. So there's a lot of value in getting uh, these folks here at the White House in addition to just giving them incredible opportunities to take pictures and, and meet the president. We also have a mobile app. And... To be honest, I think we could probably stand to develop a little bit more in our mobile footprint. But uh, it takes technology resources, and we've just been pretty um, conservative in terms of our investment in our mobile uh, footprint. Our site is, is uh, optimized, so if you look it up on your BlackBerry or your iPhone or whatever, it renders in a way that loads quickly and that sort of thing, which is good. And we also have an iPhone app that can push notifications, and it also provides live video. So what's cool is, if the president has something to say, we can actually hit a few hundred thousand people that have our mobile app, tell them the president's saying something right now, they hit a button and they're watching him live. That's pretty cool. Or at least I think, I'm biased, right? I get paid to do this stuff, but I think it's cool. All right. So how we think about our job? Being open. So last night, I just wanted to check my math on this. I mean, I, I can't read any, any, like, I don't know what all this means, but it's Google. You guys know this page, right? So if you type in Obama in education, you get Wikipedia. And the second result is our website. And when I talk about the responsibility institutions have to have content, that's what I'm talking about. People are interested in the, what the president's doing about education. Increasingly, they're going to start doing exactly what I did and seeing this link, and what they find on that page is incredibly important. It didn't used to be. It is now. And if they find something on the page that looks like that, right? That's not, that's not really going to work out. So how do we actually take this, right, and make it more interesting? Make it something successful to people. So this, this is a representative of three sort of types of content that we've done. First is an infographic. I'm sure you guys are familiar with these infographics. These are challenging because once you do one, everyone wants another. But it's really tricky to come up with the visual metaphors and the sort of charts that really help get an issue across. It's easy to skip over the hard work of actually thinking about what communicates the point you're trying to make and just put together something slick that looks nice and put it out. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can visualize this stuff. So again, I don't know if you can read, but this was an infographic about exports. And we decided to sit down and just show Americans where this plane uh, was flying, where we're selling our Boeing jets to, to, to really visualize the idea of exports. And of course, to show trend lines and that sort of stuff. The White House whiteboard. How many of you have ever seen a White House whiteboard? 
Awesome. All right. Well, that's like three more than last time. Um, <laughs> um, you should check them out. I mean, they're, they're not like, they're certainly not like things are going to make you laugh and you're, you know, that sort of thing, but they are. They are they sort of born of this conversation we had when we were thinking about policies, and we would invite guys like Brian Deese, who's this whip smart economic expert, to our office and say, Brian, what is the Buffett rule? What are these issues? And the first thing he would do would be grab a pen and show us. You know? We're like, why why can't we just do that and stop there? Again, less work, you know? It actually wasn't. Making these videos a lot of work, as many of you probably know. But the idea was, how can we keep it from turning into one of those press releases and actually turn it into a visual lesson? So we've done a number of these on a range of issues, um, every, every, everything under the sun. Um, and, uh, and they're well received. Um, the national federal taxpayer receipt, or the federal taxpayer receipt, is something the president talked about, and it's sort of an uh, example of one of our interactives. So making issues personalized to people. And listen, we could do so much more in this area, but we've started to try to take a step forward of making policies that are customized to people. So in this example, you basically type in your income and your, uh, uh, the taxes that you pay, and that's taken care of on your computer. You don't share that with the government. And based on the portion of uh, federal spending, you get to see to the cent how your tax dollars are spent on issues like foreign aid, education, defense, all sorts of things. Um, and then we get feedback on that and share that internally. Um, that's been incredibly uh, uh, popular. And then I said earlier, um, we also use the online program in service of our good government goals. This is just a, a slide I threw in about data disclosure. I can go in a whole tangent about that, but I'll, I'll just maybe sort of save the in-depth on that. But suffice to say, on the White House website, you can type in a name and see if that person's visited the White House. We publish the records of everyone who visits the White House. Right? That's cool. All right. You know, I actually, one of my videos that I wanted to show, and I'm going to stop this probably halfway. I don't want to spend all of our time showing movies. We're not in fifth grade anymore, but... Um, this is a good example of a video that we put together uh, around our health care policy. Um, and and I, I'm showing more videos than I usually would just because I'm, my assumption is that there's folks here who think about film and editing and that sort of thing. You might actually enjoy the videos for the video's sake. But um, I want to show you this, where the president basically took a site that might not be that um, interesting and added a lot of value just by showing people how to use it. Hello, everybody. I want to talk with you about a new consumer website, healthcare.gov. It's a good resource for understanding the new law, and it offers a few simple tools to help you take your health care into your own hands. For the first time ever, you can see all your insurance options, public and private, in one place. Let me show you how it works. Now, I have pretty good health care these days, but let's roll back the clock to when Michelle and I were just getting started in Chicago. From the home page, I choose my state. Then answer a few more questions. I know you guys are riveted, but I'm going to stop it there. My, my point is that, you know, you, you again, you can put out these tools and these content, but oftentimes just showing people how they work in a very plain language way is incredibly important. Um, and, and this is a good example, one of the... One of the um, examples of us connecting the work of the White House to an actual new citizen service. So this was incredibly important that we communicated because it was a new resource for American citizens that had, had come from the Affordable Care Act. Um, again, I don't want to get into how much about health care policy, but allowed them to sort of learn more about health care insurance and find the best deal for them. All right, so this is the exciting part. How do we create meaningful opportunities for people to be able to participate in their government? And one of the... Um, one of the sort of uh, large examples that sort of brings together a lot of these pieces uh, is what we do around the State of the Union. The State of the Union is the biggest speech the president gives every year. It's a speech he gives to uh, Congress. Uh, and he goes over his agenda, the things he thinks are really important. And before I get into some of the events that we do afterwards, um, if you'll notice, we call this the Enhanced State of the Union. And you've got him here. And to his right, you've got a visual companion 
of what he's talking about. Now, as a side point, like this was actually, we think, really cool. But it's not much different than what local TV anchors do. And you guys probably practice this too, you know, like tonight and the da 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 da, and like the graphics showing up there, you know? Yes? No? All right. Um, don't leave me hanging here. Um, you know, we felt like, you know, that was a really interesting uh, idea. The idea that you could have a visual companion to what the president was talking about, so that when he says, you know, exports since 2005, and da 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 da, and people are like, okay, whatever. You can actually see, like, well, this green line is what we set out to do, but it turns out the blue line is just above it. We're doing all right. You know, very quickly, like that. And we do that throughout the speech. The speech is like, you know, 45 minutes long. We do like 50 or 60 slides. It's sort of a higher wire act, to be honest, to like coordinate it because we do it live. Um, but we've gotten an incredible ton of feedback on that. And certainly our most, uh, it, it's, incre it's more popular than just putting out the regular version of the speech because we didn't do it the first year. Um, and since then, we put this out and it gets shared a lot more. But it's not just good enough to do uh, State of the Union. The State of the Union, we live stream it. We get millions of people to tune in uh, and watch it. We watch it on their phones. They watch it on their computer, their iPad, whatever. Right? It occurred to us that it was an incredible lost opportunity just to flip the switch when he's done speaking. What happens to all those people? You know? We're like, let's just keep them on until the wee hours of the morning. You know, let's see how long we can take this. And so as soon as the uh, president's done speaking, we spun up an event at the White House. So if you're the end user watching this on your computer, as soon as the president finishes, a card comes up that says, stand by, uh, we're going to be taking your questions about what the president talked about live from the White House. Uh, here's how you can participate. You know, Twitter, Facebook, what have you, post your questions. And we, we, um, I think the, the, the last number is that we keep about 20 to 25% of our viewership on when the speech ends. So you see a big drop off, but then you actually see it, it stay. People are interested, right? And so we have a live audience at the White House just to kind of give the room a little bit more energy, sort of like this, except for more energy. <laughs> Come on. Uh, and, and sort of take questions both from them and both from uh, social media. So you can see we have the experts. See Brian Deese up there again. He gets roped into all of our stuff because he's kind of into it. Um, folks are asking questions about the issues. And what's really important for us is if someone has a question about an issue, it's likely that other people share the same question. You know? And so for us, prioritizing the president's speech, absolutely. That is a number one thing to get out so people can understand what he has to say but also making sure that we are putting out content that addresses the concerns and reactions people have is also important. You know? One of the things that we can stand to improve on, and I think just generally tools that hopefully be developed, is organizing those answers, getting an FAQ, sort of figuring out when you have 20 or 30 reactions after a speech, how do you make that content accessible to people so they can find it? Um, but getting that content out there is important in and of itself. Um, and then we also do a, a different kind of engagement not just after the speech, but uh, throughout that week. And, and frankly, we do it all the time on a bunch of issues. Uh, we call it White House Chat. I was saying earlier, it's sort of like office hours here uh, or at schools. Do you all have office hours here? Yeah, OK. So the idea is like we don't have sort of this ambient sort of online footprint where it's like fire question at us and we'll answer it. We, just, we don't have the resources to, to do that. So we don't set that expectation. You know, it'd be sort of like your professor saying, whenever you have a question for me, call me on my cell. Are there any professors that do that here? Yeah, yeah all of you. All right, okay. Yeah. So for us, we set uh, an expectation. We say, look, we're going to have an expert um, sitting in a computer, looking at your questions, post on that hashtag, and answering them as they come in. We do it for 45 minutes, an hour. We see hundreds of questions come in. We answer as many as we have time for. Uh, and uh, they, they range on a whole uh, host of topics. And then, of course, we've done some other really cool events that I just wanted to talk about briefly. Um, up here uh, is the uh, YouTube uh, event that we do. Um, the first one of these we did was in March of 2009. How many people have heard of Google Moderator? Google Moderator? All right, I'm giving you a lot of cool stuff to go check out, so just check it out when you're done. It's pretty simple how it works. Google Moderator, how many of you have heard of Hot or Not? More, okay, good, yeah, I figured. So 
So the way that Google Moderator works is you can pose a question and you can vote on questions. So um, if you have a question, you just submit it to the form. But when you go to the site, it also presents a random question somebody else submitted, and you can vote, I like that or I don't like that. Right? It's a basic, basic thing. Hot or not works the same way. Is this person good looking or not? And you know, they rise to the top or not. Um, when we put this out in March of 2009, we had over 200,000 questions submitted. I think we had nearly three, 3 million votes. I don't remember if it was 2.3 or 3 million votes. People were just sitting there choosing which questions they wanted to see and, and the sort of wisdom of the crowd. Over time, they rose up. And the president answered the questions. Who can guess what the most popular question was? Anybody? All right. Marijuana legalization. <laughs> Seriously. This was something that people cared about, right? At least online. And they were, they were ready to organize around it. Uh, and the president answered it. Uh, and, the, and the president answered a whole range of issues. We didn't control what he was going to talk about. We had a whole event at the White House about this. His answer, and his answer has been uh, consistently that he thinks it's a legitimate debate, but he doesn't support legalization. And in the context of this event, he also pointed out that he didn't think it was um, um, the right way to solve our economic issues because it could have been printed, pointed in the, in the context of taxing it and all that sort of stuff. So he addressed it. And, and honestly, like a lot of people didn't like his answer. But that's okay. At least he's answering it, right? It's progress. So, bunch of questions come in, they get voted on, the most popular ones rise to the top. We now do this after the State of the Union with videos, and we invite YouTube in, and uh, they sort of run the process in terms of uh, you know, getting the tool out there, making sure they're getting the right videos and the questions there in front of them, and then he answers it. A few days after the State of the Union, after it's had time to be watched. So we publish the on-demand version, we'll get two or three million views of that thing, that's when uh, you know, we want to get people's questions after it's had a week to run. And then uh, how many of how many you, you use Google Plus? Is it sort of happening here yet? No? Yes, no, I know, yeah. <laughs> so Google Plus is really interesting for a few things. You know, it's, 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 um, one is its impact on search, which I think is a, we're seeing the beginning of, and, and who knows where that will go. But Google as a search engine, obviously very important. The notion of identity around the Google system, very important having content that comes up in those search results, like the White House search result, associated with identity is an interesting concept early on. We'll see where this goes. But I think that's one very interesting thing that Google has that other folks don't have. Another tool that they have uh, that we think is terrific is the Hangout tool. This is a free multi-point video chat system right here where you can have up to 10 people and the software automatically detects who's speaking and switches the a camera to pick up on the person who's speaking. It's pretty cool, right? It's free. So, you know, I could have done this on Google Hangouts, so just, you know, be lucky, you know, feel lucky. So, uh, we've done these with the president where he did, uh, he had, he sort of interacted with people around the country, and then we actually do these on a regular basis with policy officials, where we'll actually just post on our Google page, on Twitter and Facebook, do you want to have an online conversation with our director of economic policy, with the, full, with the person who's in charge of uh, supporting uh, startups in America, uh, and so forth? And people come on, they ask all sorts of questions. So that's one sort of framework for engagement. And frankly, it's, it's the one that's, I think, the most sort of traditional question and answer. What I've been doing for the last hour and a half, it feels like. But um, the idea that reporters can ask questions, you answer them, you add to the public debate, you know, that's fine. I get that that's not the most interesting thing to you guys. Um, it's, it's, there are more interesting frameworks I'll talk about, but the idea of engagement goes from this model, right, the broadcast model, and to some extent sort of the like raising awareness model, to these models. So, you know, soliciting input, this is sort of the question and answer one. This is like, this is the big, this is the big kahuna, you know? This is the idea that government can be a platform. The government can actually inspire people to do things amongst themselves. That government isn't the sort of central place. It's a participant in something bigger with maybe some extra uh, uh, abilities to sort of drive a national conversation, to convene experts together and so forth. But what's happening here 
This is the goal. You know, how we can actually um, encourage people to organize amongst themselves. So we did this campaign uh, called, What Does $40 Mean to You? Um, and before, I'm going to play the video from this before I go into the sort of nuts and bolts of it. I'm a perfect example. Actually, before I go into it, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on the policy. I just realized you guys won't have any context for this. So in the United States, we recently had a policy debate. There was a tax cut in place for people on their payroll taxes. If Congress hadn't acted to extend that payroll tax cut, it would have meant that, on average, Americans would have had $40 less in each biweekly paycheck. That was the issue. Congress ended up acting, but it was only after there was widespread public outcry about this. And the president, uh, as part of his economic policy in the, state the, in the speech to Congress, had called for this and really pushed for this in the context of many of his other policies. And so in the course of, of driving this campaign, which I can talk about in a, in a second, we involved a lot of regular people in the process, and, and we sat down with a few of them when they came to the White House, sort of asked them about that experience. And this is, uh, this is what they had to say. I'm a perfect example of what speaking out means. I'm here at the White House. I met President Obama. I shook his hand. I just, I, you know, shared my story with the White House, had no intention of hearing back, but now I really feel that I'm being heard, and it makes me really kind of invigorated. I had a chance to come to the White House today to share my story about what losing $40 a paycheck would mean to me, and I think it's important that people take the time to really think about the impact uh, that the things going on in America make in their lives. It's clear that your story will be read and will be considered and um, can have a big impact on uh, the White House and the President and people who are making decisions. So it's worth it. I have never in a million years dreamed that I would be sitting here and talking to you. I sent one in just thinking, well, I'm just going to add my voice, and here I am today. It's been very heartening for me to see how effective I can be, uh, how you know, just sending uh, a letter, an email, uh, making a call doesn't go unnoticed, that there actually, there, there's actually somebody on the other end, somebody who cares about what you have to say. I think it's very important for the American people to stand up and be counted and make sure that their voice is heard. Speak up. I never thought I would get invited here. <laughs> and so always make your feelings known. Be civil, be polite, but be firm. I'm really encouraging you because I'm just a regular citizen. They called me and asked me my opinion. They wanted to know what I thought. They were inspired by my story and it could happen to you and anybody else. We're all in it together. And we all have to look out for one another because we're American. I encourage everyone out there to uh, respond and let uh, others know how you feel about what $40 would mean to you. So if you have a story that you want to share, I know the president wants to hear it. And I would encourage you to do as I did and submit your story through WhiteHouse.gov. Don't discount your voice. Your voice is important. I never thought that my letter would be read, yet here I am. I encourage you to submit your stories because nothing changes without grassroots support. And, and this is the very definition of grassroots support. It may be done electronically or by tweet uh, in this day and age, uh, but it's still the same. You can make a difference. Uh, don't short sight yourself. All right. So what what was that? You know, what was that, that whole video sort of... Uh, makes you feel really good, but there's a lot of, I think, tactical work that goes behind that. Um, when we knew that this debate was going to happen, one of the things that really um, was a, uh, an asset in some ways in terms of organizing was that there was a deadline. Something was about to expire. And so we knew we had a few weeks to really get the public attention on this issue and engage Americans on this issue. Uh, we set up a countdown clock on the White House website. We actually put it in the briefing room at the White House. And we started pushing a campaign built around the idea we weren't going to use the, the language payroll tax cut extension. We weren't going to use wonky language. We were going to personalize this in a way where we talked about what $40 meant to you every two weeks and ask people to share their story about that. And what was amazing is 
it took off in a way we never anticipated. We didn't plan for this to be as big as it ended up being, but it was just one of those things that resonated with people. And as soon as we put it out, people started sharing it, they started retweeting this thing, and we realized it was going to get a little bit bigger than we thought. We started frantically start creating more content to, to feed into this, to sort of keep the cycle going so people understood the issue. We started retweeting other people's stories. We started to try to step away from being the central part of this debate and elevate regular people's story into this debate so that other people would respond. And it worked. This, these are some of the things that people were sharing. One of the things that was really resonant to me is when we talk about the impact of these, we typically run to the extremes. We say, without $40, people won't be able to afford their health care uh, uh, prescriptions. There's life and death, you know. What was really powerful, as we saw in terms of people's reaction, were the more everyday things. There was a father who posted and said, without 40 bucks, it just means I'm not going to do pizza night every week with my daughters. It's the thing I enjoy. I'm just going to have to cut that. You know, people are talking about sacrifices, the impact of public policy in really human terms. And for you media critics out there, this was, this was the, the point where I knew it was really something um, special. Was I, I came in to the office the next morning, and I had CNN on, and the anchors were sitting at their, their anchor desk, or whatever you call it, and they were reading the messages of regular people who had been sharing their stories as they were talking about this debate in Washington. They weren't talking about the White House. They weren't even talking about President Obama. They were talking about this issue and how people were speaking out. We had had a role at the beginning, but it became something that was larger than us, and it became sort of this framework around which citizens organized. Since then, we've really started pushing this framework even more. We recently had a uh, uh, campaign around college loans, and the president, in his speech, said, all right, we have a hashtag for this. It's don't double my rate. What is it? And all the students were like, don't double my rate, you know, back and forth. So you're going to see more of this. It was an incredibly uh, uh, instructive lesson for us. Uh, and and you know, as you saw in the video, it was really important to us that we recognized you know, who really drove this uh, and invited a lot of the people who, who spoke out to the White House. And so I want to uh, also talk about We the People. And this is the video that has me in it, but I think the video actually does a better job explaining what this is than, than, uh, than I could up here. But in, 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 in the simple point is that we, we've talked about two frameworks of engagement. One is answering questions. The second is raising awareness. The third that we're really interested in is how people can impact policy how they can actually drive what's happening at the White House. And if you set up a form and you say, hey, Internet, what, you know, what's on your mind? You can imagine what you're going to get. Thousands of responses. Right? Thousands. So we came up with a framework that actually set expectations so that people could organize around ideas and show us which ones were the most popular in a similar way to what we did with the question and answer in Google Moderator. We the People is an online petitioning system that allows anyone to create a petition for the White House to take action on any uh, possible federal issue. It's pretty wide scope. The only thing is, we, we respond to petitions that have reached a thir certain threshold in 30 days. We started off with 5,000, and we got so many petitions, we actually had to raise the signature threshold to 25,000. We've had over 100 petitions that have reached that threshold. We have over 2 million users that have already used it. We just launched it in September. And one of the questions that we get from this is, um, are these real? Like, you know, like, is this is a gimmick? Are you, like, just doing this petition thing? And, like, we know it's not, because we spend a lot of time working within the White House to kind of change the culture of the White House to actually make this interaction meaningful. And so what we did is we put together a video to explain to people actually what happens when the petition comes in. And I warned you, I'm in this. Since we launched We the People, we've heard uh, all sorts of praise and criticism for this new type of online engagement, including a lot of people that said, hey, take this stuff seriously. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that we do. Every week we get together to discuss petitions that have crossed the threshold. And so when a petition crosses it, it becomes a part of that conversation. The right people at the White House, the people making the policy decisions from the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy all the way through the different policy offices are actively discussing these issues. Well, we knew that there was a hunger out there uh, for an ability to petition the White House and give us 
uh, a sense of, of how much support there was for various ideas, but we didn't know how big it was. We really are trying to be as accessible as we can be. That's why we've created so many opportunities through our website for people to reach out to people here who are working at the White House. There are issues that are on live petitions right now on We the People that senior members of the White House are having meetings about because the issue came to us through We the People. Being able to say, look, 60,000 people signed a petition on We the People in just a matter of weeks, it's impactful. We're always looking for fresh new ideas and we find that many of the best ideas uh, don't necessarily come from people inside the West Wing or this building or the complex, but from out there where people are creating jobs and figuring out how to grow the economy every day. So uh, we've gotten some really good ideas. I've enjoyed talking to people about them. If there, is a, if there is an issue that people are really feeling and it generated enough attention that enough people signed the petition, it definitely is something that we should be considering and be thinking about. If you get enough signatures on a petition, it gets on the White House's radar. This is new to something like the government. Uh, to be able to use the internet to rapidly scale the amount of voices that can be brought into everyday discussions here at the White House, uh, and they're, they're showing the public that those uh, discussions are happening by formulating responses. Sometimes those responses are just clear articulations of where we stand and why we disagree. Sometimes their requests for further engagement will invite the people who created the petition in to have those conversations. And sometimes they're actually changing policy. And it's critical that we continue to get public feedback about how we can improve. Because no one here at the White House thinks this is perfect. We think it's the right thing to do. Making sure that we're speaking to people about the issues they care about. And oftentimes, uh, that means issues that we aren't currently addressing in our day-to-day -day activities. And so we're really excited to see just the scope of things we've been able to talk about so far. We're looking forward to seeing even more come in. All right, so I'm running out of time, and I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up, and I'll actually stick around and take some questions if, if we can. I, if you guys need to leave during, I won't be insulted. Um, but, you know, I was trying to think about you know, where, I'd, where I'd leave this today with you guys, um, just given, you know, what you're studying and, and generally that you all seem a little bit younger than I am which I'm saying more and more these days. Um, this is an incredibly exciting time to be alive, to be involved in this field. When I went to college, uh, we were just getting an email. I remember what card catalogs were. How many people here know what a card catalog is? Right? The rest of you are really lucky. It was like a big box full of cards to tell you where the books in the library were. Then we had the internet. Since then, we've had an incredible rate of change. When 2005 I came, we didn't know how to put video on the web, then YouTube happened. 2006, we're trying to figure out how to reach people and Facebook happened, Twitter happened. Now we have Foursquare, mobile payments. All of this stuff is rapidly changing the way we communicate, but it's also rapidly changing the nature of relationships. In terms of the industry, you should all recognize that given the fact that you've grown up natively in this, you're incredibly valuable. You intuit the things I have to spend time and effort on understanding. Don't sell yourself short on that. That is an incredibly important thing. You understand the social norms and mores and, and the things about how people use this stuff in a way that executives don't. And, and they look for, they understand the overall arching goal, but in terms of tactics, they're looking for this expertise and you live and breathe it. So if you think about where we were 10 years ago and where we are today, and then you pause and you think about where we're going to be in 10 years based on this rapid rate of change, it is an incredibly exciting time. And it's been an incredibly exciting few days to be here. I, I, I'm in, just in, blown away by both the government uh, of Israel but also the country learning about what's happening here. Uh, it's, it's just been an incredibly valuable uh, opportunity for all of us. Uh, so we really thank you for the time, for listening to us. I'll stick around and answer questions. But again, if you need to take off and leave, no problem, but thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Macon. It was inspiring and for the right audience. Great. And we appreciate very much all of you, Kemi, Peter, and we appreciate uh, our friends from the government, uh, Eitan and Yoram, for bringing this tremendous group here. And we have to go for lunch, so you okay. cannot answer too many questions. All right. So thank you very much. And I want to remind you that tomorrow we have a digit conference on online journalism, which you're all invited to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.